Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to this session on deep learning for geometric data. It's a pity I cannot see you in person, but hopefully I can. Uh, I will be around during the QA session uh, scheduled for next week. I'm Niloy Mitra from University College London and OB Research. And uh, this talk will also be shared by Paul Guerrero, who's also a researcher at Adobe Research London. Since we are going to talk about deep learning in the context of geometric data, for the sake of this talk, I will ex expect some background in supervised versus unsupervised learning, that you're familiar with the uh, terms about what, what's the training data, validation data, test data, you are familiar with the basic building blocks, which is an MLP, which is essentially can be thought as a function approximator. And we will see various examples of that, a neural network in general and convolution, convolutional neural network, at least in the case of images, which uh, is, is a very regular data structure. And I will assume some background in autoencoder and variational autoencoder. Uh, generative adversarial network commonly referred to as GANs as a way of matching a given probability distrib distribution given as examples to come up with very realistic generator and also basics of graph uh, graph based neural networks and Paul during his talk will talk a lot more about the graph based approaches. I know this is a lot to expect as background, so please, um, if you are interested and want to know more about this, you can use the QR code on the right to find out a lot more on these topics. These are extensive course notes we had prepared for a version of a much longer tutorial we gave at SIGGRAPH and Eurographics in the last couple of years. So in the uh, since this is SGP, we are all interested in geometry processing. Let's just quickly look at the typical type of applications we are interested in geometry processing. So we are, of course, interested in modeling for uh, just in general, but specifically nowadays for AR and VR applications for jointly processing images, scans, meshes, and this is uh, commonly referred as multimodal data analysis semantic 3D reconstruction and analysis and reconstruction, and also more broadly as creating content or authoring content in the case of animation, rendering, image generation, etc. So the most typical example is 3D modeling. So what, what is deep learning useful for? Like it can, uh, so here's an example for a few years back where the system, which is, uh, which suggests the next best part to add, it's a part based modeling system and where to add it. So starting with the seat of a chair, it suggests that like, the next thing you want to add is, is a back and then the legs and then maybe a bit more to finish the structure. And here's another example for a brain spread. So this is a very simple, simplistic example where the network is used to, to suggest two things. What is the next part to be added and where to add it? And this general paradigm is called autoregressive networks. In the case of pic images, pixel CNN is the most famous in this example. And uh, there, there's various, um, subsequently various papers have proposed this for modeling for objects, for layouts, and a bunch of other 3D data structures. This being able to create 3D data is also useful for image understanding. For example, if we have realistic 3D data, we can use it uh, to synthetically create supervision signal in the form of sur surface uh, normals and semantic segmentation, um, and maybe uh, or, uh, the planarity of the different phases. And then it can be shown that even on the synthetic data, very high quality networks can be trained that transfers well to, um, to real data which is quite an advantage because it's difficult to acquire large volumes of real data. Uh, this goes, uh, this is a continuation here where we do semantic scene understanding from a depth data and maybe this can be just depth or depth plus RGB. And then the network uh, as shown here does a completion and semantic segmentation. So it completes the parts that were not seen and also labels them as floors, walls, beds, windows, etc. And finally, uh, as a final example, here's uh, a, a preview from one of our works where we also create uh, geometry of the shapes, create the roof structure, create uh, 
how the whole uh, area in this case the city line looks along with the, and along with the final texture that's put on the on top so these are the type of applications we are interested in now what is so special about doing deep learning in the context of 3d data there's a few fundamental uh, issues that are worth discussing so probably the most important thing is the how the data grows so when we go from an regular grid which is a 2d grid to a 3d grid the number of voxels goes from or the number of pixels from n square for an n by n grid goes to n cubed for an n by n by n voxel grid right? however the number of occupied cells is very different because we are talking about a surface representation to show an example for the chair on the left as we voxelize the space with with voxels as the voxel size decreases, as we go for finer resolution, most of the voxels are empty. And only in the, in the example on the right, only 2% of the voxels are occupied. All the others in the voxel grid are empty. This is a huge waste of memory, as you will see later on. What are different ways of representing 3D objects? As you do, uh, this can be points, this can be voxels, this can be triangles, this can be cells, quadratic patches, or higher order patches, or even sine distance speed. And we will talk about multiple of these things. Now, um, there are a few things to note here. In the case of images, we always have a fixed neighborhood structure. That means we have a north, south, east, west, Maybe if we also want to take the corners, then there is northeast, northwest, southeast, southwest. So that's it. And it's a fixed regular grid except for the boundary. That's why when we have we have very um, very efficient processing on in the cases of images, that's why CNNs are so powerful there. When we go for 3D data, this simple assumption breaks and leading to the necessity of coming up with new structure. For example, in the case of points, we do not have any direct neighborhood. In the case of voxels, we have neighborhood, but maybe then the cells are not equal in size. Um, or in the case of SDF, which is a sign distance field, we have a plus value inside and a, uh, and a minus value outside and the distance from the surface at each location. So these are very different representations, and each of them requires its own way of handling. So to summarize the challenges is one is which representation to pick which uh, and corresponding to the chosen representation how do we process the neighborhood information and then whether we are working on the extrinsic shape as the shape is embedded in the grid or we want to have an intrinsic representation that captures uh, the essential uh, spectral properties of the mesh, uh, as you have seen in, in one of the other tutorial where Justin talks about extrinsic representation or spectral representation. And then of course, we, given that we are going to run this on GPUs, we need to be memory efficient and how that affects the runtime of the system. So for this talk, I will broadly structure it into five parts, depending on the different uh, representations and what are the popular methods in this uh, in this uh, area. Uh, I've tried to structure the talk to give you the main ideas uh, in the different domains and with references so that you can follow up these papers. There's a lot of material that I'm going to cover, so um, you may have to look at the papers for a bit more detail. So let's start with the image-based representation. Now, this is probably the simplest approach, how things started about five years back, uh, but already a very powerful approach. So suppose we are given a 3D object in the form of a mesh. So how do we convert it into CNNs? How do we convert it into a form that CNNs can work with? Now, the standard CNN works on images. So can we convert meshes to images? The answer is yes, we can bring in a lot of cameras. These are virtual cameras. And we render out the object, creating these sub images as we see here. Okay. Now, for each of these images, we can run a CNN. And this is a network trained on image data. The, the novelty here is this view pooling layer, which takes this view specific CNN output, CNN features, and runs it to another CNN network. 
Now, the clever approach in this multi-view CNN is it maps the 3D problem into a regular data structure by having a fixed rig of cameras, which results in the collection of images. So you can think of this as a kind of related to light field in general computer graphics. And uh, then this can be used for training classification talk. This is a very powerful idea. So the main building blocks are the CNNs that are used in uh, normal image analysis. The only uh, new thing needed is the camera-based rendering. This idea can be taken even further for doing uh, combining depth and RGB images for doing semantic segmentation. So here's the what's going on under the hood, under the hood. So for each of the RGB information, there is a 2D network because the camera is fixed based on the scanner. And this gives two features corresponding to the RGB. Then there's a voxel net network, which is the bottom right one that gives voxel based features. And um, because there is a known mapping between the 2D feature, 2D pixel location and the voxel, the corresponding features can be merged or concatenated and then passed on through a 3D convolution for again doing prediction. We already saw the results in the pre previous slide. We can take the multi-view CNN idea further by a small change, which is instead of imaging the whole object, the, each location or, or parts of the object is, is imaged. That means instead of an image capturing the whole chair, there's a bunch of images for the top half of the chair or the top corner of the chair or the leg of the chair, etc. And then they are then view pooled as, as we saw before and the rest works uh, as, as exactly with the multi-view CNN. So the only difference here is breaking the original object into small patches and then taking the image. This allowed generality then in, across shapes because the backs of the chairs are often similar, even though the legs are different and the patch based approach would capture. Now we start to get into more complicated approaches. So this is uh, one of the recent very uh, influential paper called the Tangent Convolution, where the idea is taking a set of points and we'll see later when we do PCP net um, and projecting it to a, to a tangent plane. So that means the 3D point set becomes is treated as a height field essentially. So on this tangent plane, locally we get a set of points. So these are the points. And these are the sparse set of points, which are not necessarily on a regular grid. The way they convert it to a regular data is they do a um, Gaussian mixture model on top of this to get like an image, and then it's again processed as an image layer. So the main idea was to project the local point set, the 3D point set into tangent planes to get a sparse representation that is then mapped to the Gaussian mixture model. And as you see here, uh, which is called ours, it leads to a better network. And some of these other networks like the point net and oct net, we will talk about later in this, uh, in this tutorial. And this is an example of semantic segmentation. So to recap for the image based, the advantage is we can leverage all the existing networks in image networks. So the performance is often very, very good. The, the, on the negative side, we need a rendering in the uh, rendering that is used as a pre-processing here. So then the rendering can be so slow and memory heavy and not very geometric. The next natural step going from images is to go for voxel representation or volumetric representation. And the most uh, naive approach of the direct analogy would be instead of taking image grids, we take voxel grids. Okay. Uh, recall the, the one of the motivating slides we had where we saw that most of the cells here are going to be empty. But in this paper, they don't worry about that they uh, just take the, the k by k kernel of CNN and map it to k by k by k, so uh, th uh, three k, k cube kernels, and then directly process this. Okay. Uh, because they have a fixed grid, this voxel net can unroll these, uh, these voxels into a, long, um, into a long vector, which can be seen as, 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 as a rotation about the axis, and this can be very efficiently uh, processed. 
The bottleneck here is it cannot be used for large shapes because we are the n cube grows very quickly and we run out of memory. A very similar to image case, the different layers or the activation functions as learned by the network can be seen. And these are slices of them uh, on the NYU dataset or the model net 40 dataset. And as you can see, they capture maybe the horizontal surface or the vertical surface or the diagonal surface. And you can also look at the higher level or the uh, later layers of the, of the network. So in this volumetric context, the, the first thing we saw was directly doing and uh, going from the volumetric data to do a classification. This is what we saw in the voxel net. Here, what we did uh, a few years back was to use this volumetric representation, but as output, we directly learn deformations on the voxels. So uh, to repeat, what happens is we take an object in this case, on the, the, the car model, we voxelize it in, in the, in the subfigure B. And then we have a convnet in N cube space where the output are at each voxel uh, a deformation vector of how this voxel should be displaced. And we use this deformation vector to drive the, uh, the deformation of the model on the extreme left. And uh, this year at CBPR, there is a paper on neural cage deformation, and this is, this can be seen as a much nicer formulation of this volumetric, directly working on, on the shapes rather than a volumetric representation. And at that time, we could show that starting from a point cloud or a mesh, we can go uh, and change the change the shape of the object depending on the deformation indicator of the vector. Now, as we saw, one of the main limitation of the voxel-based approaches is the n-cube data complexity or the memory complexity. So the next natural approach is instead of having a dense uh, and a uniform decomposition of the space, why don't we do an optric? Because that's a, as we know, that's a much more efficient data structure. The problem then becomes is although the memory problem is handled, the neighborhood is information is very different. So as you see here, uh, any, if you look at any of the voxels in, in this octree, it's on one side it might have a small voxel and then another side it might have a big voxel. So it becomes very uh, non-uniform, this, um, this neighborhood information, which makes all the steps, the, the convolution step, the pooling step, and the unpooling step, all of them complicated. And how this OCNN approaches a problem is it has a quite elaborate mechanism to store pointers for all the different neighbors. So it, it explicitly stores which neighbors are given, which is good in the forward pass. And uh, these are different examples of the lookup table. So you can go from one level to another by following the lookup table. So in the encoding phase, this is, this is perfectly fine. And this is all known. But the, the interesting part is in the decoder part, because in the decoder part, we have to do this inverse mapping. And at that point, uh, what uh, this paper shows, which is really an elegant approach, is only decodes to the occupied part of the voxel. So as you see here, the checkerboard denotes the empty region, and the, those are not even touched during the decoder region. And hence, we don't pay the end cube uh, complexity. So this is, uh, you can see that they can handle much higher um, resolution of, of the grid. So the top being uh, their approaches. Um, and this is showing the octree decomposition. As you, if you see here, the OCNN um, can continue to go to higher resolution without, with, with moderate mem memory cost, but doing a direct voxel decomposition, a full voxel soon ra runs out of memory as you would expect. The next um, step here and the final one for this stage of the, of the tutorial is this adaptive version where the observation is in sharp regions or especially in high curvature region. If we continue to build the, build the octree, we will end up with very, very, very many and very small cells, like if you see at the edges of the car or, or the edges of the aeroplane, etc. Now, 
So that's what it's shown on the left in the, in the bunny case. So what they do here is a very clever idea. What they say is instead of storing lines or linear elements, why don't we store first order patches? So it allows to process curved regions by having a quadrat quadric uh, patch or a quadratic patch or other, other higher order patches can also be used. And this allows them to not subdivide in regions of high curvature, which is quite useful. And um, one more idea here that's a few years back, but I think it's a very good um, concept to, to note, and we will come back to this in the SDF one, which is called this field probing network, where essentially an object is seen as follows. So let's say this is a bunny. Um, instead of storing the bunny, what we say is, given the bounding box of this object, if we shoot rays at, at this whole bounding box, we can only record where the ray intersects or enters the object and leaves the object. So this, these colored ones are just showing where the, um, where the ray um, pierces the bunny and comes out of the bunny. Right? And then only along this regular grid, information is stored. So these are the various probes and a probe is defined by picking two random points on the bounding box. And then we store the, the normal and the point location along that ray, which are the probes. So essentially we probe the space with a, with a set of arrows and short store information along this regular grid. And this, since it's uh, always based on, on the generic bounding box, the, the neighborhood structure can be, can be made generic and they can process it without paying the n cube data structure data cost, as you see in the blue line here. So as a final example in this section, you say, what if we do not have the 23D training data? So all the examples we saw so far require supervision exactly having the 3D data, but there are often instances we do not have 3D data, but we have recordings in 2D, like if you take your camera and record the word, these are 2D images. So what we do is we are looking back at the rendering equation. We know an image is formed of a 3D model, which is unknown in this case, uh, a view or a camera view, and a, and a contribution by material, color, and illumination, and then the image formation model or the rendering equation to produce final image. Now, in this uh, paper that we recently completed, which we call the Platonic GAN, the main insight was Many of these functions are very well known and well understood. So for example, we know the rendering equation, we know the camera matrix. So there's no need for the network to, to learn these functions. For example, we can have a visual hull, which can be written in terms of a box, if the voxel is on and off, which is given by VI, what should be the visual hull information, the absorption only information, or even emission absorption, which involves color. Right? These are known functions that we have, but the unknown beings, whether VI is occupied or not. And then we can set up a network as we show here, which is starting from an input image, we have a standard, auto -encod a standard encoder part that takes it to a latent vector Z from which there's a decoder or a generator that creates a 3D volumetric representation. Then we have a image formation block here, which is all known and differentiable to produce a, a 2D rendered image. And then we have a GAN on the right to distinguish whether the re rendered image matches the, the observed images, image samples. And this can be trained, the, the main insight here, this can be trained without requiring 3D data, but we can work directly with images. And that, that's quite attractive, as we'll see uh, various examples of this. So in this case, the, the silhouettes in shown in uh, gray to black, that, that's the input and the pink ones are the reconstruction of the airplanes. Here's an example of the chairs where the, the gray ones and the black ones are the input. And from that, from a single view, the network hallucinates how the chair would look like and same for the gun here. Note that the network never was shown explicit 3D training examples. And as you can see, it works quite well, even contrasted to 3D GAN, which is an ex uh, within a method 
trained explicitly with 3D data. And this is quite attractive for, for uh, doing reconstruction on, on images where we do not have access to the underlying 3D model as would be the case in the case of this mushroom, for example, and these are our reconstructions. And this is an ongoing effort where we see more of geometry processing and geometric representation coupled with the rendering and doing an end-to-end -end training, where the, maybe the, in this case, the rendering function is known, but there are also more recent examples where the rendering function is also learned. And this is a very um, fruitful and exciting area to work in. Here's the uh, same, uh, same paper where instead of uh, the normal imaging model, we have an X-ray imaging model. So these are X-rays from which we recover the 3D, 3D objects and voxel representation. So in this volumetric approaches, what we saw is these are fairly uh, direct applications of image networks, but uh, special care is taken to avoid paying the N-cube data structure. Still, this, uh, this requires an explicit quantization of the object, which is not desirable. So hence, we go for the surface-based methods now. Now, the first idea that was introduced is if you have an object and you come from geometry processing, you said, okay, I, I have the CNN that works on images. How can I get the 3D objects to image to me? The natural solution is we would do some sort of a parameterization. Here, they took this cat image and did parameterization using a geometry image. Um, and there are other versions of these that were proposed around similar type. And then CNN is applied directly on the image layer. So there, the main insight here is we can use parameterization tricks to go from to 3D image to 2D image. So this is a fixed function that's used once to map the object to 2D, uh, 2D domain. And then we use the CNN networks, right? So this is a different approach than the multi-view CNN we saw where it was imaged from different here. Here the surface is, is cut open and flattened into a, into a sheet by different uh, parameterization approaches. So this is a geometry image, uh, which is a quite classic method in geometry processing by now, where the, uh, the surface is taken and cut open and the normal information is stored in terms of RGB colors, as you see here. Uh, this can be applied for both rigid shapes and also non-rigid shapes. The next very interesting idea that was proposed in this domain is this idea of what are other ways we can do this parameterization. And the insight on this on this uh, geodesic patch paper is we do not do not need to do the parameterization on the whole object, but we can stick the spider webs or these polar plots or these geodesic polar plots directly on the surface of the object. And then we can define the kernel directly on this grid. It's, it's not a rectangular grid anymore, but it's, it's a polar grid, but one can still define exactly same, the convolution operation. The one ambiguity, however, is how do we fix the rotation of this grid? Because it's symmetric and rotating it uh, would, would not change the axis and would, would cause some ambiguity in the convolution operator. So they try out all the explicit possible rotations. So this is how the network looks like. So it creates these patches and then there's a filter bank which has this all the possible rotations, the, the end rotations of these objects to, to have this uh, approach. Right? And then uh, for the subsequent part, it's, it's the same CNN being approach, uh, applied but um, not on a rectangular grid, on a, on a Cartesian grid, but on a polar grid. And since then, uh, many follow-up works have been proposed, improving various parts of this uh, idea. And in the most recent approaches, they don't even need this explicit end rotation, but there is a parallel transport that's used to carry this ambiguity. More more examples of how 3D approaches were mapped to 2D. Again, this is a different parameterization approach where based on these endpoints, which are shown in this colored one, this is again, the, the, uh, the head of David is flattened using this toroidal map onto a flat domain. And then again, it's the image-based approach that's applied. 
Now, going further into this parameterization, one reason why we might want to do parameterization um, is if you have an input image and I have a target 3D object, which is different, but I want to apply the same texture onto this object and to get something like this, right? And this can be applied to many of the other objects to get this. And this is quite handy because then I can also add uh, virtual objects to this. Now, uh, in this case, this was a non-deep learning method, but, but a data-driven method. But what subsequently was done was, why don't we directly learn this mapping? So instead of assuming the parameterization is given, can we directly learn the, the parameterization function? So this is an extremely powerful idea. So what, what is given here is a latent representation of the shape. This can come from an image, can come from a point cloud or a triangle mesh. We'll see various examples later. And on the bottom, there is a 2D domain, the UV domain, or the texture domain. They have a stack of textures, but I'm showing one example here. And then there's an MLP or a function block, uh, a multi-layered perceptron, but you can just think that as a function block that takes these two and maps to a point in 3D. So essentially the goal is to learn a function uh, parameterized by theta, which are the unknowns, such that it would take a, a point set U and V conditioned on the latent variable Z to produce a point P in R3. Now, the most interesting part of this paper, this AtlasNet paper, is it is trained directly using point cloud, which is a point set P, and the chamfer distance with CD, and does not require the UV parameterization as an example or as supervision. So the supervision is in point is in, in the form of point clouds, the, the final shape, and what the network learns is a parameterization. A are these charts or the set of chart or atlas of, of the, that corresponds to the shape. And this becomes a, a very natural domain to learn on as we will see in subsequent examples. So here's example where maybe from an image or maybe from a point cloud, it's encoded to a latent code and then decoded and then it becomes this paper mache type of representation of the final object. And the texture comes from free, so that what we saw before in this so far example of texturing it, this can be done directly in the, in, using this approach. Now, instead of probing on the voxel level, we can probe, like inside, we can also probe the, we can also, also probe the objects directly by, by the object. So as you see here, the human skeleton is used as a probe for the objects for the, in, in the various scenes. And and here you see that instead of giving a, a atlas of the of the particular objects, it's it giving an atlas of the surfaces or interaction surfaces of where it it touches, right? So it, it's a complement of the Atlas Net where the probe is being used to, to find the surfaces on which the human is interacting with. So as, as a last example of the surface base, um, we'll look at the Mesh CNN, which is a paper introduced last year. And it investigated, can we work on triangle meshes and directly do CNNs there. Now, as you would recall, the main problem here or the main difficulty here is a lack of a regular grid or a regular neighborhood or a fixed neighborhood to operate on. Because if we look at vertices, they have different number of triangles coming out of it because different vertices have different valence, so there is no generic structure. So what they did there was very clever is instead of a vertex based or a face based for change, they move the representation to edge-based. And once we look at edges in a triangle mesh, modular boundaries, edges have all, always, for a manifold mesh, always have two adjacent faces. And they can also be canonically ordered using the orientation of the given mesh. That means um, we have a canonical order and we have a fixed neighborhood. For example, the, the edge E has fixed 
neighbors on one side the edges a and b and other side the edges c and d so so this this is a core atomic block and the information they store to uniquely encode this local information are five numbers. So one is the dihedral angle between the, the two faces touching the edge E. Then the two inner angles sh shown on the top right and the bottom left uh, in these uh, blue marks. And then the, the length of the perpendicular from the opposite corners hitting E, the edge E. So these are the five numbers that are stored, three of them being angles and two of them being lengths. And then what they essentially do is they define the pooling and unpooling and convolution operation directly on the edges. So the convolution operation is fairly direct. The pooling operation is motivated by how edge, uh, edge contraction happens in simplification networks or simplification in classic geometry processing. And they aggregate the information based on the simplification data structure. And then this allows directly working on the meshes without having to discretize, and they can do semantic segmentation, they can do simplification, they can do a bunch of other things. So conceptually, it's a very clean and elegant way of directly processing the meshes without requiring parameterization, without requiring voxelization. So at this point, we have seen the advantage of going from using parameterization or learning a parameterization, or in the third example, even working directly on an edge-based data structure to do surface-based processing. The difficulty if we are using a parameterization approach is we would inherit all the diff challenges and shortcomings of parameterizations. And often this is unavoidable unless the mesh quality is very good. So now we will move to the point-based networks. Now, what are the options? If we have point-based um, representation, we can, which are typical in the case of a depth scanning, or generally, if you have any scanned surfaces, is we can either try to create a surface representation by Poisson reconstruction or any of the surfacing approaches. This is already a difficult task, or we can voxelize the point cloud, but then we would lose a lot of information. So the goal here is can be directly worked on the native point data structure. Right. So in order to work with point sets, the, the fundamental um, Observation here, which is uh, in the original PointNet paper, paper uh, uh, PointNet uh, network, PointNet um, approach, is the observation that points or uh, point um, a point set is a set, and being a set, the main thing we want is it it is unstructured, but which means we cannot have an operation that depends on the permutation of the points. That means if I change the indexing of the point set, uh, as shown in the colored bars here, the final output of the point network should be should remain unchanged. That means if we have a function going working on the points, the f1 to fn, and if we permute the order of these points 1 to n, so if we just change them around and apply the function, they would remain same. And what they cleverly achieved this by the design of the network. And the network essentially has two blocks, a block which is a H block and a block which is a G block. And this is the network structure, which is uh, more complicated to, uh, which is quite complex to see in the first place. So let's look at the simpler example. So on the left, in comes N points as a set and each point has C channels, right? So for example, if it's a point set, uh, it's, it's a typical point set without any color or any other thing, then uh, C would be three. So this comes here. Now each of the point goes to the same function F. So this is an MLP that is learned, so it, it, so, but it's a shared MLP. So essentially what it does, it takes each point independently and lifts it to a higher dimensional a higher dimension because output is a C prime, which is a higher, uh, which is mapping the 3D point to a higher dimensional point set. And this step happens without 
the knowledge of any other points. So each point is processed independent of all other points, right? And that's then the amazing part is then there's another network, the G network, which takes all these points and operates on that. And then there is a max pooling layer, which, which just combines all these points together using a max, max pooling at the feature level to produce a final number, which is the classification score, for example, that can be used to train a classification score. So now if we go back to this example, to the detailed work, it starts with um, n by 3, so 3 being the dimension, there's an input transformer to, uh, to get it to a canonical position, then there are these f functions, which are these MLPs that progressively um, increase it to higher dimension. So in this case, goes from 3 to 64 and eventually to 124. So these are all shared. And then the G function is essentially this max pooling. So it's a very simple operation. And then it can be shown that this is already powerful to learn the feature for the whole point set. Note that this feature, the 1024 global feature, it's a feature for the entire point set. The lower part I will not cover right now, which is the opposite of that, which is going from the points back to uh, a per point classification score, which would be needed in, in the case of, for example, semantic segmentation. Okay. So this, uh, this point net was a revolution in this area and it was shown that it works surprisingly well for classification, for segmentation, both part segmentation and semantic segmentation. The next improvement that was proposed was instead of taking the global point set, how about we break it into small patches, uh, which is the point net plus plus, and then each time we apply a point net on this small point set. So the idea is we have a big point set, we break it into smaller patches, and each patch can be seen as another point set, and then it's essentially running point net in parallel for each of the patches. That's the essential idea of point net plus plus, and this allows more generalization. So here's a schematic, in comes the points, and then for each point, we find its k nears, the k nearest neighbor, this is the patching state, and then that is used as a point set for each row becomes a new point set on, on which point net is again applied. Okay. So point net plus plus can be seen as k nearest neighbor and a bunch of point net. Uh, we had a similar approach at the same time, it was parallelly proposed where we had the PCP net, which was used uh, for a different task for evaluating per point attributes, in this case, normals and curvature. As you will see, it's a very similar architecture where um, for a single scale, we have um, each point is broken into this k nearest neighbor and does the processing. And we also had a multi-scale a multi variant where we treat multiple scales, which are given by the radius r, to have um, features at different scale sizes. Uh, last year, we used it also for denoising of the point cloud directly. But this is with supervision data, and you can see from the left point cloud, we can go from the right point cloud. In the context of synthesis, we can um, this this has been shown that the point net can be used to go from the image directly to the point cloud, and it can be trained in a in a form which is quite similar um, at at a very high level to the Atlas Net type of having a a network or an MLP directly uh, learning this regression function. Uh, recently, we we revisited the problem, but we said we do not have the, the paired data. So let me explain what we mean by paired data. So suppose we have a point cloud, incomplete point cloud, as we see on the, on the left, and we have complete examples, as we see on the right, which are shape net ones, but we do not have one-to-one -one correspondence about which partial scans corresponds to which completed shape. So we cannot uh, work on this directly in terms of using the supervision methods we have seen, or the supervised methods. So instead, um, what we came up with is a general idea that um, that is quite powerful and can be applied to a variety of problems. So for example, suppose we create a, a latent uh, representation on the left using the scanned models, right? And this is this we can use, for example, point net or point net plus plus or your favorite uh, point-based tool. 
On the right, we create another latent uh, code, another, another encoder decoder, but now for the completed um, completed objects, right? And now, essentially, what we need to do is we need a mapping network that takes from the blue domain to the orange domain. So that's the function we have to learn. Right? So let's see how. Let's break this architecture into a few parts. So here is the encoder decoder or the latent code that we learn for scans. Here's the encoder network that we learn for the synthetic data and for the for the scans in this case. And the rest of the network is doing this translation or learning the mapping that how can we go from one to another and then we have a GAN to super to indirectly supervise this because we do not have direct supervision data. And we can see this can be trained quite efficiently and allows us to go from incomplete data, say from top left. Uh, the, the gray point scout to the completed one as we see on the bottom right. Leave the equations uh, here if you want to look back into them. Now, this allows results that we could not have before. So given this point cloud, if we do a standard autoencoder approach, we would get a completion, but it can be quite different than the original point cloud. Uh, with ours, because we have a Hausdorff loss, we can we can get a completion that retains the original point set and only completes parts that are missing in the original point set. And we show that this is better than the autoencoder approach, which is the AE approach, or the 3D PN, which is a supervised method, supervised directly with 3D signals. Uh, the original motivation we had was for real scan where we do not have supervision signal, but here we uh, are showing an, one on synthetic data for, so that we can run the other methods. This is also it's, uh, in the paper you would find examples on real data. Uh, here's a, a, another paper we had where we were doing completion by fusing information from images and 3D and I did not uh, quite know how to structure and position it because it's, it's a combination, it spans multiple domains. So it's, it's a bicycle GAN architecture that progressively uh, comes up with procedural steps to come up with what is the facade decomposition, what is the roof decomposition, and what are the different window elements, et cetera, to produce a final textured output. And all of these are trained in stages. And, tomorrow, and later on, Paul will talk about a procedural approach towards the end of his talk that extends this type of a mechanism. So, to sh so given, given a set of image sets, uh, these are given, and then we can come up with a lot of these examples, and then I'll just run the final synthesis video here for interest of time. So we starting from a blank, or not a blank canvas, but uh, with, a, with the mass model of the system, we progressively add windows, roof structures, and then textures on the facades, uh, the, the details of the geometric objects, and eventually get the object as you see on the right. Um, and we do not have mode collapse and we have control over style and, and the scale. So here's an example on running on the Madrid data set, which is um, spanning several square kilometers. You can see the completion results here with both the geometry, the details of the roofs, the, the facade elements on the side, as well as the texture on the different parts. There's several artifacts if you look close, but um, being a, a semi-supervised method, the results are, are quite good at, at such a high, large scale. So to recap, at this point, we have seen the point-based method that, the, that directly works on points without having um, to, to quantize the space. It is memory hungry and we are missing the array construction and we have a CVPR paper this year that we call the lean point net that allows a much more efficient, sorry, memory efficient version of point net and if you are going to apply point net you might want to try the, our code for that, it would allow you to handle bigger point sets. 
At the final stage, uh, uh, representation, we're going to study the implicit representation. And there are two forms of implicit representation. So for example, this, uh, this bench data set, uh, this can be represented as voxels on the left, as a set of points on the second column, as a set of uh, atlas net or triangle patches in the third column. And the fourth column, what this store is essentially a collection of planes or hyperplanes, right? And the blue points means it's in the positive side and the red points maybe means the negative side. So an object is essentially captured by the following function. It's a function that takes any point in 3D and a latent representation of the shape and maps it to zero and one, zero one being inside outside the object. So it's, it's only learns if uh, a probe or a space probe, not uh, not the probes we saw before on the voxel on the size of the of the bounding box, a space probe if it's inside or outside the object. And once that is, once we can produce this, we can use marching cube to extract out the circle. So once you see this observation, learning the uh, function f is delegated to a network or an MLP where it's directly supervised by the f theta value, which is probed at as 3D location pij, um, xi being the latent code of the object, and oij being the occupancy value at the ij location. Uh, in parallel, there was another paper that came up with the exactly same idea, but instead of occupancy, they're fitting a sign distance field, which has more information than an occupancy grid, as you would no. So now the function that we want to learn is takes a point in 3D and the latent code and maps it to a, a real value number, which can be positive or negative or zero, depending on whether it's outside, inside, or on the surface. And again, uh, this is very similar by now. You have seen this uh, type of structures, very similar to the AtlasNet uh, autoencoder uh, in, in how this is trained. Um, and here is the, the loss function where the second term, the, the norm of zi squared, that's a regularizer that you can ignore for now. The first term is essentially the same loss function we saw in the case of occupancy net, but instead of this oij for the occupancy value, they have this sj, which is the sign distance field value. And there's subsequent approaches to that. So I want to conclude with this, uh, with this more this challenge or the thought that do we need um, always all these representations or can we leave it to the network to directly come up with the representation? So here we are presenting BlockGAN, which is um, currently on archive, where the goal is, can we directly learn um, features at an object level? So instead of being an explicit uh, representation, whether at point cloud, triangle mesh, voxels, or um, our sign distance field, we leave it to the network to decide how to encode the objects at each voxel location. It creates uh, a higher dimensional feature that is learned. But then again, very much like the platonic GAN, the, how these features are, are moved when, under object interaction, like rotating the object is explicitly encoded. The camera, which is a theta cam, is also explicitly encoded because we know the camera function. But after that, <clears throat> once the camera has been uh, applied, we have these higher dimensional features coming and mapping to location in the, on the camera grid. So we have a, a learned rendering function that is that takes these features and produces a vinyl image. Now, there are two key advantages here, rather three key advantages. One is we do not have to pre-decide what representation to use. The second one is we do not attempt to learn the functions that we know, for example, how to rotate an object in 3D or how to project an object from 3D space to the camera space. And the most important advantage here, this can be trained with unsupervised. So we can directly take a collection of images and let the network find out what is the object, how to represent the object, and what are the features to be learned. That training time, this is what happens. We, we randomly generate these, 
the z values etc and at test time we can we can have explicit control on the identity of the object on the movement of the object or rotating the object and um, any of these things we can also add more objects in, into the scene of course we can also delete objects from the scene now here is an example on a synthetic data set where we create various pairs of cars and rotate them about the individual object now so far this seems quite Quite interesting, but what, because it's a supervised method, we can immediately apply it to real images, and you can see the complexity of what we see on the right, because it, it implicitly models the geometry, the appearance, the light in, uh, information. As you see, the specular highlights are quite well preserved in this data set. So that concludes the the part of the tutorial I was going to cover where we went over the different representations and we tried to summarize the main ideas in how do we process a, a, a 3D data, in this case a bunny, whether it's given a triangle mesh or a point set or as images or a sign distance field and what are the corresponding ideas in coming up with networks both for analysis and synthesis. So with that I will conclude this part of the presentation and I would be available next week to take questions and you can find a lot more details on our website and, and also on the bigger uh, course material and lectures we gave a couple uh, last year. So uh, the tutorial will continue and Paul will present the second part of this tutorial. Thank you. Thank you for coming to our tutorial. I'm going to present the second part which is about learning with 3D shapes that are not only described by geometry but also by some higher level structure. In graphics, objects like this abstract sculpture are typically represented by a geometrical description of their shape, like a point cloud. But in the case of more familiar man-made objects, like this chair, we have additional knowledge. We know which parts it is made of and how these parts are related. Here's one example of expressing these relationships as a hierarchy. I will call this decomposition into parts and their relationships the structure of a shape. If a shape has a clear structure, like most shapes in our everyday experience, we typically think and reason about it in terms of the structure. So it makes sense to work with the structure instead of a purely geometrical description. But of course, these part decompositions of 3D shapes is not the only domain where structure can be useful. There are many domains where data is naturally represented as a structure. For example, in 2D layouts, individual elements and their relationships are naturally represented as a kind of graph. In a similar way, 2D patterns can be represented as a layout of elements that are related by geometric relationships. And scenes are often represented by scene graphs. So one central question I'm going to discuss is in what ways we can use structured representations in geometric deep learning. So what are the advantages of working with structure? In many cases, it is possible to use a traditional unstructured representation as well. For example, point clouds for 3D shapes or images for patterns. And after all, representations like sample grids and point clouds have received more research, giving us a lot of mature, simple and effective methods. But one big advantage of structured representations is that they provide additional information. This information may be important or even indispensable for downstream tasks. For example, knowledge about parts and relationships in a 3D shape can make editing tasks much easier. Or in the case of scene graphs, knowledge of edges is necessary to perform some operations, and these edges cannot be recovered from the geometry of the scene alone. A second large difference is that using a structured representation changes the data flow and inductive bias of a network. Networks can more easily reason about the relationship of parts that are connected by edges, since there is a direct path between them, making it easier, for example, to maintain symmetry between parts. And their inductive bias is more aligned with our own way of thinking about these shapes. Instead of blending parts together, inaccuracies introduced by the networks result in parts with slightly incorrect positions and sizes, but that are still clearly distinguishable as separate parts, making the whole shape look more plausible. These last two examples are from a project I'm going to describe later on. 
structure has been used in a lot of domains like scene graphs, floor plans, and so on. Here I'm going to focus on methods that work with structured 3D shapes. I will focus on some typical challenges in this domain, and I'm going to present a few examples of methods that address each challenge. First, I'm going to talk about finding good representations for structure. Um, then I'm going to describe how some methods find structure without supervision. And finally, I'm going to uh, discuss an interesting direction for future work, structuring not only individual shapes, but giving distributions of shapes more structure. For example, structure that describes relationships between different shapes uh, more explicitly. So let's start with structure representations. A well-known early work in this area is GRASS, which presents a generative model for structured shapes. GRASS uses a part-based representation, where shapes are represented by a set of individual parts, like the backrest or legs of a chair, or the candles or the arms of a candelabra. For simplicity, each part is represented by a cuboid, and these cuboids are found in a pre-processing step. These cuboids can be related by one of four relationships, adjacency, and three symmetry types, translational, rotational, and reflectional symmetry. The qubits together with the relationships can be represented as a graph. More specifically, the authors use a tree to represent the structure. Starting at the leaves, parts are successfully grouped by one of the relationship types, like the adjacency of the two parts in the armrests, and the groups are then in turn related to each other in higher levels of the tree with one of the relationship types. For example, the reflectional symmetry of the two armrests. And this is repeated until we obtain a single group of all parts at the root. As we will see, this tree structure simplifies the architecture of the encoder. But it also introduces some limitations that I will discuss later on. The structure is encoded and decoded by recursive networks. Each type of relationship, like adjacency or translational symmetry, has its own encoder that recursively encodes part groups. The encoding process starts at the leaf nodes, for example, the two legs on the left side of the chair. First, two box parameters, uh, the, the box parameters of each chair leg is encoded into a feature vector. Then a feature vector for the group consisting of the two chair legs uh, is encoded with the adjacency encoder. And on the next high level, the reflectional symmetry encoder is used to get a feature vector and so on, until reaching the uh, single feature vector at the root node that represents the entire shape. The decoder performs the inverse operation, starting at the root and recursively decoding part groups until reaching the leaf parts. The structure of the tree is given as supervision during training, but the decoder also trains a classifier that decides which decoder to use next given a feature vector. For example, whether to use the adjacency decoder or the symmetry decoder, or if a leaf part has been reached and the decoding should stop. The decoder is only used at inference time and is responsible for decoding the structure of the tree at inference time. Um, this encoder and decoder are used in a version autoencoder setup. I'm not going into detail on version autoencoders, but the general idea is to learn a latent space that we can sample from randomly at inference time to generate novel shapes with structure in this case. Um, to improve uh, the generated shapes, the authors add a second stage where discriminator is uh, used to improve the generated chairs. Um, the discriminator has a similar architecture as the encoder. And in the second stage, um, the other two networks are fine-tuned. After training, we have a generative model that we can sample from to synthesize new structured shapes. The qubits are a relatively coarse representation. So to get a more detailed geometry, the authors can also fill the qubits with voxelized geometry as a post-process to get uh, these more detailed shapes, as shown here in red. The geometry of each part is estimated based on the cuboid parameters and some features that describe the structural context of the part. For example, here the geometry for the chair seat is found based on the feature vectors of the chair seat itself and the feature vectors of its parent group, which is um, the chair base, as well as the feature vector of the root node of the tree. The generative model itself, however, is not affected by the detailed geometry. The tree structure is generated based only on the cuboids and not on the detailed part. Here are some results of the method. Um, shapes in four categories were generated, candelabras, um, excavators, airplanes, and uh, chairs. And both the generated 
cuboids are shown and also the generated detailed geometry, so filling in each cuboid with a more detailed voxelization. Um, as you can see, the shapes uh, look relatively realistic and reasonable, but one thing that would be interesting to see here, which was not directly shown by the authors, is uh, to show the closest example in a training set, just to see how well this method uh, creates novel shapes instead of just recovering them or retrieving them from the training set. Maybe more interesting to get a better understanding of the layout of the latent space that is produced by this method um, is this interpolation between the green shell on the left and the red shell on the right. Here we can see that discrete parameters like the number of parts in the translational symmetry groups or in the rotational symmetry groups are increased stepwise in discrete steps. These stepwise topological changes are different from what we would see in a latent space that was trained without structure where there is no notion of individual parts that can be added or removed step by step. And we would see more blurring and merging of parts as a result. I'm going to show a comparison of the two interpolations in this uh, structured and unstructured latent spaces in a bit. One interesting application that is enabled by the structure is structure-based shape retrieval, where a query is given and shapes with a structure similar to the query are found. This can be done for only a substructure as well. For example, we can search for chairs that have similar backrests or chairs that have similar bases, as shown in the first two rows. And here the red part is the uh, sub part of the shape that we search for. So in summary, this method shows that structured shapes can be represented as a tree of parts, where chairs represent relationships between parts and nodes represent either single parts or part groups. The structure can be encoded and decoded with recursive networks, which gives us an interesting shape space with a layout that also considers the structure of an object and not only its geometry. This allows, for example, for different types of interpolations between two shapes that consider the structure as well as the geometry. And it also allows for some interesting applications like queries based on the structure of either the entire object or a part of an object. While this approach works nicely in many cases, the choice of representing the structure as a tree also introduces some limitations. First, uh, it cannot represent all relationships between parts. Since each part or group of parts only appears once in a tree, it can only take part in a single relationship, even though in reality parts can have multiple relationships. For example, they can be adjacent to one part and can be symmetric to another part. Second, the tree introduces some ambiguity. It admits multiple different hierarchies depending on the order in which parts are grouped and which relationships we use to group them. The authors sample these hierarchy variants randomly to generate a training set, meaning that the same shape can be represented with multiple different hierarchies. This ambiguity of the representation makes it harder for the network to learn the structure and limits the variety of shapes in the dataset that can be handled by the network. We're going to show a different representation next, which uses a less ambiguous representation of the structure to handle a larger data set with more shape variety. This is a method we presented in last year's SIGGRAPH Asia called StructureNet, and similar to GRASS, the goal is to create a generative model for structured shapes. More specifically, we want to create a smooth shape space from a given data set of objects like these chairs, and we would like to encode both geometry and structure in this shape space. Since we haven't yet seen any explicit comparison between a structured representation and a more traditional representation that uses geometry only, take the interpolation between these two chairs as a motivating example. We show this interpolation in a latent space that encodes geometry only and a latent space that encodes geometry and structure. If we interpolate these two shapes in a latent space that does not encode structure, uh, we get a reasonable interpolation of the coarse geometry but individual parts get lost in the intermediate steps, like the armrest or the bars at the base of the chair. And here's the same interpolation with StructureNet, where we make use of structure in the latent space. You can see that individual parts get added discreetly until we reach the target shape, in a way that seems better aligned with our own intuition about shapes and how they are assembled. In each step, parts are still easily distinguishable and form a realistic object. In StructureNet, the geometry of individual parts is either modeled as a point cloud or as a bounding box of the parts. 
In either case, the generative model directly works with feature vectors to describe the part geometry. So unlike in grass, the part geometry can influence the structure that is generated. The parts are arranged in a hierarchy, which we represent with an array tree. But there are additional properties of chairs that this hierarchy alone does not capture. Symmetry, for example, is a critical property of a chair. Without it, the chair does not look very realistic. So to model these properties, we add additional edges that capture reflectional symmetry edges, as well as other types of relationships like rotational symmetry, translational symmetry, and adjacency. Adding edges between all pairs of parts is quite expensive, but we have found that the most important relationships occur between sibling, uh, siblings, so between uh, parts that share the same parent. So we only add relationships between sibling parts. The structure typically has a higher degree of consistency between shapes in the same category than the geometry, which, make, which makes it easier for the network to learn a good shape space. Uh, in these three shapes here, you can see that even though the geometry and the topology of these shapes is quite different, uh, their structure is very similar. We use a data set with annotated structure to provide the hierarchical decomposition of objects into parts. Note that these chairs naturally decompose into an, an array structure. Directly working with this enary structure avoids the issues of canonically ordering, for example, the legs of a chair or any of the smaller struts or bars that can occur in the chair, um, giving us a less ambiguous representation than the representation that was used in grass. This also allows parts to have any number of relationships, like symmetries to other parts, and makes it possible to train with a larger data set of more varied shapes. I'm going to show a comparison to grass a bit later. I'm not going into a lot of technical details, but in general, the idea of the method is to use a variational autoencoder to learn our latent space of structured shapes. An encoder is trained to encode a shape and its structure into a latent representation. So each shape is encoded as a latent feature vector in the shape space. And a decoder is trained to recover the shape and the structure from the latent representation. To give you a coarse idea of the encoder and decoder, let's take a closer look at the structure of an object. We can see that each group of siblings, together with the relationship edges, forms an undirected graph. Each node of this graph is decomposed at the next lower level into another sibling graph, and so on, until reaching the leaves. We make use of this structure by recursively encoding each of these graphs with a graph encoder. This encoder, together with a similar decoder, form the version out encoder that we use to learn our latent space of structured shapes. Once trained, we can use our latent space for several applications. The most straightforward application is shape generation, where we generate structured shapes. Here we show a few examples of generated chairs and tables. We can also use the latent space to interpolate between two shapes, as shown on the right. As we have described before, this interpolation preserves the shape of parts, and parts get added and removed uh, step by step during this interpolation in an intuitive way. This slide shows that the generator does not only retrieve existing shapes, but does indeed generate novel geometry and structure. On the leftmost column, we show three generated shapes and the closest matches in the training set on the right-hand side of that. Notice that they are quite different, both in geometry and in structure. All of these experiments are performed on a larger data set with more varied shapes than the data set that GRASS was trained on. Since GRASS has a more ambiguous representation of the structure, it does not perform as well on this larger and more varied data set as you can see here. We can see that the part geometry and the structure of the parts is reconstructed much more accurately with StructureNet. In another application, we train a specialized encoder to project full or partial scans into a latent space. We can then reconstruct these projected scans with our decoder to give us a full shape uh, with a structure. Here the scans were taken from a different data set than the one we used to train our version of the encoder. Finally, we can also edit shapes more efficiently by editing a single part, the yellow part that you can see here, which gives us an unrealistic shape, for example, a shape with a single shorter leg, and then project the edited shape into our latent space while keeping the edit fixed. This gives us a realistic shape that implements the given yellow edit. So in summary, learning shapes with structure instead of learning shape directly enables applications like reconstruction of structured shapes 
and editing that would not be possible without structure. And it also changes the inductive bias of the network to better align with our own way of thinking about shapes that are assembled from individual parts. While hierarchical representations of the structure of an object seem quite natural, there are also alternatives, and I'm going to briefly mention one of the alternatives here. Inspired by natural language processing, PQNet represents structure as a sequence of parts. Similar to the previous two methods, GRAS and StructureNet, the detailed geometry of each part is encoded with a dedicated part encoder. Here implicit functions are used to represent the part, uh, the part geometry instead of point clouds as in StructureNet or voxels as in GRAS. But unlike the other two methods, the authors represent the structure as a sequence similar to how text sentences are treated. For training, the order of parts in the sequence is assumed to be known and assumed to be given in the dataset. And both front-to-back order and back-to-front orders are encoded. But only the front-to-back order is decoded. The authors don't give an explicit reason uh, for encoding both directions, but I assume that it makes the encoder more invariant to the ordering of the parts. And the authors do indeed show in the results that um, the encoder can be trained to take in random sequences or random orderings uh, of parts. So this is an alternative to the more hierarchical representations, which avoids using recursive networks in favor of more traditional sequence encoders. As we can see here, the results are quite nice. The structure is plausible and the part geometry seems reasonable. The sequence decoder allows each newly generated part to be based on full knowledge of all parts that have been generated up to this point unlike in a hierarchical network. The downside is, however, that a consistent ordering for all parts needs to be given, which, as we discussed earlier, is not always easy. The authors show that this method can also be used to consistently order parts that are given in a random order. This is done by training a specific encoder that takes as input a random ordering of the parts and projects it into the pre-computed latent space that was trained with consistent orderings of parts. So when the decoder decodes this latent vector, it will give a consistent ordering of the parts. In all the previous methods, we assumed that at least some part of the structure was given as supervision. But this can be a limiting assumption, since it restricts us to use the small number of datasets that do have this annotated structure, while there's a much larger number of datasets that do not have these annotations that we can therefore not use. This limits the generality of the models that we can train, since the shapes in the annotated datasets have limited variety. Next, I'm going to present methods to find the structure in an unsupervised way, which would allow us to exploit unannotated datasets, and thereby improving the generality of our methods. An early work in this direction was presented at CVPR 2017, which abstracts detailed 3D shapes into a small set of cuboids. So each shape is represented with a set of cuboids, and the cuboids should approximate the shape as well as possible with a fixed maximum number of cuboids. Few cuboids can also be created by predicting an existence probability for each cuboid. This representation of a shape with cuboids is similar to the previous representations we discussed, except that there are no edges between parts that describe the relationships between parts. The qubit parameters are predicted with a volumetric CNN, uh, starting from a voxelization of the 3D input shape. The predicted output qubits are compared to the input shape and are encouraged to approximate the input shape using a geometric similarity loss. This loss measures the distance of points on the qubit surface to the input shape surface, and also the converse, so the distance of points on the input shape surface to the qubit surface. Both of these can be efficiently evaluated using signed distance functions, and this is what the authors do here. Here are some results showing the qubit abstractions of some shapes in the ShapeNet dataset. And one interesting result is that even though no other ordering or semantics are prescribed for these cuboids, um, the cuboids between different shapes are still semantically consistent. For example, the same qubit is always used to um, represent the backrest of a chair or the seat of a chair. And other decomposition papers have also found similar results. Forcing the network to represent a shape with separate parts gives an unsupervised way of discovering semantic parts of an object, probably because a consistent decomposition of the object into cuboids 
is easiest to learn for the network. These unsupervised keywords that this method um, generates can be seen as a first step towards discovering the full structure of a shape in an unsupervised setting. The keywords can also induce a segmentation of the shape, for example, by assigning each surface point to the closest cuboid. This effectively gives a co-segmentation of the shapes in a category, where segments are semantically consistent between all shapes in a category. The results are similar to earlier co-segmentation results, except that here more explicit constraints for part correspondences are used, like the cycle consistency in earlier works. Next, I'm going to discuss a method that learns a full structure representation, including the hierarchy, in an unsupervised setting. The shape representation that is used here is a hierarchical representation, very similar to the representation used in StructureNet. Starting at the root, the shape is hierarchically decomposed into successively finer parts at each level. This is done for a fixed number of levels, or three levels in this case. Going down the levels from the root, each level has exactly twice as many par uh, parts as its parent level. But uh, parent-child connections between parts are not explicitly predicted by the network, and are found separately. More specifically, each child part is assigned to the parent, it has the largest overlap with. So a part can have any number of children, although each child part has exactly one parent, the parent or the part with the largest overlap in its parent level. The fixed number of leaf parts also means that leaf parts typically over-segment the shape. For example, on the top row you can see an airplane, and in the second level, the fuselage is split into two different boxes, even though using two boxes does not improve the approximation quality over using a single box. To decide when to stop subdividing parts, the authors therefore train an additional component that selects a subset of parts in this hierarchy. So the yellow parts that you can see in the hierarchy uh, corresponding to the rightmost airplane on the top. The selection of part subsets is also trained without supervision. So let's take a closer look at the architecture and the training setup. The architecture is similar to the previous method we discussed for the qubit prediction. A volumetric CNN is applied to a voxelization of the input shape to predict a fixed number of qubits, except here it is the qubits in all hierarchy levels. The authors use an octree-based uh, convolutional network here instead of the full volumetric CNN to improve the performance and handle denser voxelizations. To obtain an adaptive subdivision, a second module is trained that takes as input a feature vector of the input shape and outputs a selection probability for each predicted qubit. At inference time, the selection probabilities can be thresholded to get a subset of parts that form the adaptive subdivision. Initially, only the encoder and the qubit prediction module are trained. In subsequent training stages, the encoder is fixed and the prediction and selection modules are trained alternatingly. Similar to previous work, there are several geometry losses that encourage the predicted qubits to approximate the input shape. Several additional losses encourage a well-formed hierarchy. First, parent qubits should cover all children in the hierarchy to ensure that each child part has a parent. Second, for the adaptive subdivision, three losses encourage selecting a valid subset. One loss encourages selecting a single qubit along each path to the root to avoid missing some parts of the shape or selecting multiple overlapping qubits. And another loss encourages selecting fewer parts, which forms a trade-off with the geometry loss that encourages more exact approximations of the geometry with the qubits. Finally, there are several regularization terms that discourage the generate qubits and prefer symmetric qubits and qubits that are aligned with each other, since symmetry and alignment are typical in man-made objects. Here are some results showing example decompositions of several categories. I think the results look quite nice. Uh, the adaptive part selection seems to work quite well, although it would be interesting to see how sensitive the method is to loss weights, uh, for example, for the trade-off between reconstruction accuracy and the number of qubits that are generated in the adaptive subdivision. We can also see that the generated qubits do not always attach to each other. This is probably since the qubits approximate the part geometry and do not bound it. So giving more weight to the coverage term in the loss might uh, alleviate this issue. 
These last two methods are described to discover an unsupervised structure are not generative models in themselves. But they could complement methods like Grasso structure it quite nicely by allowing them to train on data where structure annotation is not available. These unsupervised methods could either be used to annotate a data set of 3D shapes uh, as a preprocess, or maybe more interestingly, their unsupervised training approach could be integrated with methods like StructureNet or Grass to allow these methods to directly train on data without structures, without supervision. In the last part of this tutorial, I'm going to talk about an interesting direction that has been explored very little, but which is an interesting direction for future work. The idea is to focus on shape distributions instead of individual shapes and give this shape distributions more structure. Similar to how structure of shapes explicitly relates individual parts of these shapes, we want to make relationships between different shapes in the whole distribution more explicit. For example, a shape distribution in a given latent space. Let's take a look at the typical latent space of the previous methods we discussed, StructureNet in this example. Even though the layout of the latent shape space is improved when working with structure, it is still hard to interpret since it is not constrained to have any particular arrangement. Take for example the shape on the left that corresponds to a point in the shape space. We can edit the shape, giving us a different point in shape space. But how would we find an analogous edit for a different shape, for example, the third shape here on the right? The traditional approach here is to perform latent space arithmetic. We can take the difference vector in latent space and add it to the new shape. This might work in some cases, but fails in many others, like in this example that was taken from the structure net latent space. What we want is something more like this shape, which exists in the latent space but we don't know where it is. So in a traditional latent space, we know very little about the relationship uh, between points in this latent space. The next work I'm going to present is looking specifically at this problem. It is called struct edit, and we are investigating how to obtain more consistency between edits in the latent space, which is one step towards a more structured shape space. Recorded that in StructureNet, we represent shapes with both their geometry and their structure. The main idea in struct edit is to work with edits of shapes, or in other words, differences between shapes or deltas between shapes, like the two shapes shown here. These deltas are hierarchies of part edits, part insertions, and part deletions. So we can use a similar hierarchical encoder and decoder as in StructureNet to encode the shape deltas. We cannot encode the deltas between all pairs of shapes in a dataset, since this would result in a prohibitive number of deltas. And we're also more interested in sparse edits that only change some aspects of the shapes. So we define shape neighborhoods that determine which shape deltas we work with. We only use deltas from a source shape to a shape in its neighborhood. If we base these neighborhoods on geometric distance, for example, we obtain geometric neighbors, which are shapes with similar geometry, but potentially different structure. If we base the neighborhoods on structural distance, on the other hand, we obtain structural neighbors, which are shapes with similar structure, but uh, different geometry. For example, the different part sizes that you can see on the right-hand side. In struct edit, we learn the distribution of these deltas conditioned on the source shape, with a original outlink holder similar to StructureNet. So intuitively, we learn the distribution of the shape deltas in the neighborhoods around each shape in the dataset using a variational outlink holder. Learning this conditional distribution of shape deltas instead of directly learning the full distribution of shapes has two advantages. First, as usual for autoencoders, training a variational autoencoder to learn these conditional distributions will discover the main modes of variation in these distributions. Since we encode shape deltas, this, this uh, gives us the main edit modes of each shape. For example, here, the main edit modes may include changing the type of backrest or adding armrests. Second, to compress information in its latent space, the version autoencoder will consistently align these edit modes across all neighborhoods. This means that in these conditional latent spaces of shape deltas, we can transfer analogous edits, unlike in a latent space that directly encodes shapes. So as you can see on the right, 
directly transferring the vector in latent space now gives us the correct analogy for the given edit. Here are a few more examples of discovering edit modes for chairs and tables. You can see that the edit modes are quite diverse, but also maintain some aspect of the source shape. We show both the geometric and the structural neighborhoods, where the geometric neighborhoods have similar geometry, but vary in the structure, whereas structural neighborhoods have similar structure, but vary in the geometry, for example, have different sizes of individual parts. On the left-hand side of this slide, we compare edit transfer with StructureNet and StructEdit, which are denoted by SN and this E. You can see that in StructEdit, encoding the conditional distributions of shape deltas helps with consistently transferring edits. On the right-hand side, the edit is defined by pairs of images. We support this cross-domain edit transfers with a similar uh, approach as in StructureNet, by first projecting the images into a latent space to obtain the corresponding 3D shapes and structures, and then performing the edit transfer as usual. So in summary, our work on StructEdit has shown us that learning conditional distributions of shape deltas gives us a latent space with more structure. This enables applications like discovering the main edit modes for any given shape in a dataset, or shape analogies, where edits are transferred from one shape to a different shape. It is clear that a lot of things still need to be done to get more structured models of distributions. While we added some structure to the latent space with struct edit, it is still a continuous feature space where correlations between features are only encoded implicitly. That means that while it can be learned directly from data, it is still not as easy to navigate as other more explicit representations of distributions, among other drawbacks. On the other end of the spectrum, we have programs or procedures. These can also model distributions, but do so more explicitly, with symbols and operations that explicitly describe features and their correlations. And uh, these uh, programs or procedures are therefore easier to navigate, but harder to create from a given set of data. One compromise we have been investigating is to learn a distribution of programs instead of shapes that can each describe a small neighborhood of the full shape distribution. And in another project, we're currently working on a data-driven method to create programs that can model a given data set. So the overarching idea to obtain more structured distributions is to combine the advantages of both approaches by learning to create programs from data. We are currently working on an initial effort in this direction, where we create a latent distribution of programs that can each be used to create multiple shapes by modifying its parameters. Here you can see an interpolation in this learned program space, where we interpolate between the program that generates the shape on the left and the program that generates the shape in the second column from the right, so the blue and yellow shape. In this learned space of programs, the latent space captures a lot of the variability between the shapes in a category that would still be hard to express explicitly in a program, like large structural and topological changes, while the program itself captures the remaining variability. For example, here you can see that we added the shape on the right to obtain a shape with some uh, changes that you can see uh, in red in the code. Another example we're currently working on is in the domain of material authoring, where materials can be represented with graphs of operations similar to a program. This gives a fully transparent and very powerful way to edit materials, but requires significant effort and expert knowledge to create. Each graph can generate a distribution of materials, and unlike a latent distribution, it is easy to edit for the interpretable and has proven to be very successful in practice. We're working on a method to model a given distribution of material images with an operation graph, where a network learns to find the operation graph from the distribution of material images. <laughs>
This enables casual editing of material images without requiring the expert knowledge to build the graph. This concludes my part of the tutorial. The slides will be uploaded to the URL you can see here. And thank you for listening.